Okay, I think we can start now. So yeah, hi Liam, glad to be connected. Hello everyone. Today we have a very special guest, Liam Dagnan, and he is coming from the compliancy group. He's a senior account manager and uh, as a team and his own company, they focus on creating uh, the HIPAA compliance and provide software and solutions around solving and simplify compliances through the HIPAA, uh, through other practices that are required for decision makers, for small practices, as well as medical vendors. So welcome, Liam, to the webinar. And uh, maybe would you like to introduce yourself as a start? Yeah, brilliant. So uh, thank you for having me. I usually appreciate this. And uh, I'll say from an introductory perspective, you know, you know, my background is really in risk management. So I was actually very heavily involved in the insurance space for uh, about four and a half years uh, before coming to compliancy group. And I think transitioning from more of the risk management space into compliance, it was kind of a, a natural segue for me. And uh, I, I'll say, especially, I, I, I take a great interest in the way that HIPAA applies to SaaS companies and healthcare technology companies, which is, I think, what we're going to be specifically discussing today, uh, because it has, uh, there are a lot of unique factors to take into account with it. And that's hopefully what we're going to be touching on today. So, yes, yes. And um, as I shared earlier with all of you, our learning goals today would include learning about the fundamental elements of an effective compliancy program, uh, simplifying your HIPAA journey, protecting your business from breaches and fines. And then, of course, a uh, lot more depth into HIPAA compliance. And I do have some of my own questions as well as I'll be opening the floor for all of you guys as well to ask questions with Lam today. So, Lam, uh, why not we start with a small presentation that you have um, as a starter? Let's go dive in from there. Yeah, that's perfect. And so, what I what I wanted to do just to start is um, a, a lot of the more nitty gritty details we're going to be getting into as we go over different questions and things. Uh, so, feel free to ask your own questions even as we go through here now, so that we have them uh, and the questions that Ayush had prepared as well. Uh, but just foundationally, I thought it would be helpful to go over some of the very general basics of HIPAA compliance in terms of what you need to be keeping in mind, how this usually applies to somebody like, let's say, a SaaS company, software provider, healthcare technology company. And uh, unfortunately, HIPAA compliance as a whole is very heavily misunderstood because there's so many different layers to it, right? So the regulation has been around since 1996. So in a lot of capacities, it is somewhat outdated, but there's been continuously new rules passed onto the original privacy rule under HIPAA. So you have the security rule, you have the breach notification rule, you have the omnibus rule requirements, and then tied in with it is a lot of other layers like high tech, uh, there's something called macro MIPS within the healthcare space, which is more regulated by the CMS. So just so many layers to HIPAA compliance and a lot of potential for misunderstanding because of that. My goal here, just in opening this up, is to gonna is gonna be to kind of dispel some of that fog a little bit to try and just give complete clarity as far as what is usually expected of you under HIPAA, what you need to be keeping in mind as a technology company. And just the way that this all plays out. Now, the document that you see here on the screen is actually something called the seven fundamental elements of an effective compliance program. Uh, this comes directly from the Office of Inspector General uh, and Health and Human Services. You see the Starbucks logo there because it's kind of an interesting thing in the sense that this is not just something that is used to implement things like HIPAA compliance. Uh, this is actually something that a lot of big corporate environments use to build their brand and standardize their operation across a very broad spectrum of locations, providers, services, uh, even so companies like Starbucks, uh, even big corporations like Amazon, okay, uh, even if they're not heavily regulated, are using some version of this to ultimately streamline and grow their operations. So this is not just something that you, you would be wanting to use in a heavily regulated environment. This is something that you could use in general just to grow your business. Now, before we get into all of the different specific elements here and the different requirements, 
most important thing to highlight is actually just that word effective. Okay. What is required under HIPAA is that you have an effective compliance program. What does that mean? Well, a lot of the regulation is so broad that it was almost written in a way that's intentionally vague. Because if you think about who HIPAA has to apply to, right, you have massive hospitals and insurance companies, and then you have small single doctor practices. You have huge corporations like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, all three of which are actually regulated under HIPAA because of the services that they provide in the healthcare space. And then you might have a small startup software company. Many of you might even be in that same category. Where you have to kind of begin when it comes to HIPAA in navigating all of this, it's not just a matter of checking these things off of a box for the sake of saying that you did it. It's a matter of practically understanding what could be somewhat vague, broad guidelines, and then implementing them into your company in a way that's going to be specifically effective for you, right? Uh, because what's effective for you would probably not be effective for a corporation like Amazon or for a healthcare company or for anybody else in between, right? It's a uniquely individual thing, but there's some general guidelines that you could follow in the realm of making sure that this is being done properly. Because what tends to happen within a software company, let's say, is you're very heavily technology focused, okay? Uh, and so there's this general misconception around uh, we get inquiries all the time from companies that say, how do we make our software HIPAA compliant? And the interesting thing is that HIPAA itself doesn't regulate softwares, okay? It regulates companies. And so in the broader sense, in order for you to be able to say that your software is HIPAA compliant, it's really a matter of making sure that your company is HIPAA compliant. Your software can only be compliant within the context of the organizational compliance requirements of HIPAA. And about 80% of what HIPAA requires is really not gonna have anything to do with your technology at all. It's gonna be things like a risk analysis. Okay, so you'll see over here on the right, uh, there are very specific self audits that are required under HIPAA to be done on an annual basis, regardless of who you are. Then the process of identifying and remediating any gaps that were found in those audits. Now, the bulk, about 80% of what HIPAA would require you to implement, 20% of it, yes, might be related to your technology, your software program, different measures that need to be implemented there. But a lot of it is gonna have to do with implementing clear policies, procedures, trainings that need to be done for HIPAA with anybody on your staff who might be exposed to patient data as a result of the services that you're providing, tracking that documentation. If there are third parties that you're working with, making sure that you have business associate agreements in place with them, that you have clear processes in place for managing any incidents, okay? Here's what tends to happen is that when you are very, let's say, focused on the just the technology piece, or let's say the IT security side of this, you wind up having gaps in a lot of these different areas when it comes to HIPAA compliance, because HIPAA is a very administrative regulation. So you might do something like a security risk assessment, neglecting the more other administrative audits that are required for the HIPAA risk analysis, but then you'll only have security related remediation efforts. You'll only have security related policies, procedures, and maybe only some trainings. You'll have a lot of missing gaps in the higher level compliance program requirements of HIPAA. So in order to do this properly, it starts with that full HIPAA risk analysis, which is then gonna tie into all of the other kinds of documentation that you need, okay? That is the only way that you could really say that your software is compliant, right? The, is if you know that your company as a whole is HIPAA compliant. And so that's where it that's where it always needs to begin. Now, uh, I give that just as a general, we'll say, introduction to the overall framework. Of course, that is very high level. We can get a little bit deeper here into some of the more specific requirements, and I'll kind of break everything down. But uh, happy to start taking questions here, Ayush. Sounds great, and I think uh, it sets a very good tone for the discussion because. Uh, I think uh, Liam, you've done a very good job in terms of, um, you know, keeping it very simple, but still very useful points here, uh, directly differentiating 
um, around the areas where people may confuse a lot, actually. Like I myself uh, providing software service in healthcare and I, uh, I can see myself, you know, having all these questions which you just shared, you know, around like uh, how things are really. Like it is always, um, like there's so much literature available, but it's not as clear as you just cleared it out. So thank you. <laughs> no, of course. And I think a part of the problem is frankly, if you're doing research online regarding HIPAA compliance, a lot of what you could read is going to be designed for a medical practice or a hospital, right? Uh, because that is who HIPAA was originally designed to regulate. Right. It wasn't until 2013. So in, in 2013, there was something passed uh, called the omnibus rule, mm -hmm. uh, which is where business associates or healthcare vendors now needed to become compliant because mm -hmm. they were providing services to covered entities mm -hmm. that exposed them to patient data. Uh, there was a five-year grace period on that. So it wasn't even really until 2018 that the government started enforcing this, which mm -hmm. creates a little bit of a backlog now, right? Because we're mm -hmm. about maybe three, four years in, right? Uh, to actual broader HIPAA enforcement. But uh, that's part of why it can be a little bit difficult to get clarity on some of these things, yeah. Right, right. So some of the questions that I follow are uh, very typical, I'd say, especially, you know, questions that I even come across with our customers as well. Like uh, uh, my first question um, is like, uh, uh, could you walk us through the steps uh, that one has to take or your recommendations? The, to initially become HIPAA compliant. I understand some of these things were already covered in your uh, presentation, but would you like to comprehensively explain this? Because that's the first thing everybody questions. Like, what are the steps that I could just take to at least uh, get started or initially get HIPAA compliant? Yeah, so the most foundational requirement of HIPAA is going to be that initial risk analysis. Okay. Um, so the risk analysis for HIPAA, the best way that I can explain it is that it's kind of like the annual HIPAA checkup, right? It's the expectation that as a company, once per year, you're expected to be conducting a comprehensive assessment of your risks, mm -hmm. documenting any gaps that were found in that assessment, and then documenting how you are remediating those gaps mm -hmm. or how you're fixing them. Okay. Uh, the risk analysis for HIPAA breaks down into six individual audits. So if you wanted to be writing some of this down, I could, of course, even uh, we have some resources that could be provided on some of this. But basically, the six audits that you, you need to be done, and forgive me, and for most of you, this would only be five because the, uh, there is a privacy assessment that would not be required since you're not treating patients. Mm -hmm. uh, first, there's a general IT risk analysis. And okay. something called an asset and a device audit, meaning your overall IT systems need to be audited, uh, along with any devices that you have that could be connecting to either your cloud services or uh, be able to access directly your client or patient information. Okay, so that's kind of the IT aspect of HIPAA. The third piece is going to be a physical site audit. Now, for the overwhelming majority of you, if you're providing a cloud-based service, you don't have any physical site exposure to patient data. It's all in the cloud. So usually what would be required under HIPAA is more like a cloud storage assessment, which is where you review your actual, uh, like let's say your hosting service, okay? If you're or using like AWS, AWS. <laughs> AWS, Azure, exactly. Make sure that you're using the HIPAA compliant version of those hosting services. Because a lot of you, so let's say AWS, their hosting out of the box is actually not HIPAA compliant. So you're going to want to reach out to them, ask, uh, make sure that you're on the HIPAA compliant tier of their hosting. Mm -hmm. If you're not, make sure that you upgrade to that. And part of that process is going to be signing a business associate agreement, right. okay, which is a requirement of HIPAA. Now, the other three audits are going to be, or I'm sorry, the other two audits is going to be something called high tech subtitle D and then a security standards assessment. These are audits of your existing internal HIPAA policies, procedures, and trainings surrounding HIPAA compliance. That is the bulk. So that is probably the heaviest lift for most of you on this is going to be implementing those policies and procedures and trainings that would be required of HIPAA. Uh, and the only way that you really will be able to even figure out what your needs are is by doing that risk analysis, right? Because if you go through the process of doing that assessment, you'll then know where your gaps are 
to then be able to implement the necessary things that you need to become HIPAA compliant. So I, that is my ultimate recommendation to everybody is if you have never completed a HIPAA risk analysis, mm -hmm. that's where you have to begin because that has to be documented annually for the compliance program regardless. Uh, so it's a great place to start. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. So uh, a follow-up question to this would be like, uh, how early do you designate a uh, compliance officer on the security audit in your software journey? Do you have any inputs on that? So it's, it's an interesting question because really for, for most, so I'll say for most of the software companies that I've worked with, who the compliance officer is, who the privacy officer is, it doesn't always matter too much, okay? The reality of it is that the government just requires that somebody in the company has compliance officer in their job description as part of the HIPAA compliance program okay. requirements, okay? Uh, but really, if you just look at your company and you think about, okay, so let's say somebody that handles more like the HR or the operations side of it, that might be the person that you want as your privacy officer, because they're going to be handling things like the policies, the procedures, trainings, mm -hmm. and stuff like that from an HR perspective, right? Whoever you have managing, like, let's say either the security or the development of your platform internally, if you outsource development, that's another story. But let's say you have somebody that's just a fit, more handling the security side of things in your platform already, that person could be a great fit for either the security officer or the compliance officer role. Um, it doesn't matter too much, right? As long as you have that person kind of figured out and you have it in their job description, uh, however you want to approach it as a company, it's more or less up to you. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, uh, like uh, again, um, if this means that you could have someone in the company, let's say, be designated to that role. So to what extent are these uh, HIPAA uh, policies or security policies um, are uh, boilerplate versus how much they are customized, like how much work is really involved, basically? Sure. So I'm, I'm, I just stopped the screen share so I could see your face a little bit better, Ayush. Okay. Uh, but basically, um, it depends, right? So from the perspective of HIPAA, uh, the policies are more or less going to be set in stone, right? So the policies that you need to have in place for the compliance program are already required of HIPAA, okay? So you need you, there's going to be very specific security policies that you need, uh, specific privacy policies, specific trainings. Okay. Mm -hmm. The policies themselves are almost always boilerplate. Okay. So mm -hmm. there's not going to be a ton that needs to be customized there beyond mm -hmm. figuring out which policies apply to you because of your internal situation and which ones that, which ones that don't. Mm -hmm. Where that changes is when you Actually, when we stop talking about policies and when we start talking about procedures, mm -hmm. that is what is almost always going to need to be customized to your individual situation. Because you can think of the policy, so the policy is what the law requires, but the procedure is how it's implemented or operationalized in your company, right? How you as a company apply that policy internally. So uh, mm -hmm. the policy is gonna be boilerplate, but once you get into the actual procedure side of things, you will need an accompanying procedure for each policy. Uh, that will, will be up to you to implement how you see fit, right? So you could very easily implement more, let's, we'll, we'll call them a boiler, boilerplate set of policies, but then customize your own procedures as far as how you are implementing that policy. Okay, right? okay. Okay, so basically what, the policies remain same, but the implementation or execution could be different could be different. And what's most important with that is that it's it's documented, right? So mm -hmm. however you are implementing that policy has mm -hmm. to be documented in the procedure section of that policy, right? So okay. more than just doing it, it has to be clearly mm -hmm. documented because especially dealing with the government, right? It's It doesn't matter what you're doing in practice. What matters is what you could prove on paper, okay? So very okay. important that you have that clearly documented. Right. Okay, okay, fair enough. And um, now this is one of the, I'd say my favorite question because it comes so often um, in my conversations as well. Like what is the minimum viable? Maybe this is another way of asking uh, what I already asked, but uh, it just so happens so often that what would be the minimum viable HIPAA setup 
required before having a functional platform or before having uh, you know like uh, availability that you could reach out to healthcare practices or implement your software so what would be that minimum hip viable hipaa is there something like that yeah so it's actually a great question there's not necessarily a minimum viable hipaa uh, but you do have to keep in mind that there, there's really no such thing as 100% HIPAA compliance, period, right? Mm -hmm. There's always going to be things that you need to address. There's always going to be ways that you could be further, uh, let's say, complying with a, with, a, with a different rules, things that you might need to implement. What the government requires is that you are able to document what's called the good faith effort, right? So okay. let's look. So let's say that we're looking at a broad selection of the HIPAA requirements. You have risk analysis, you have the implementation of policies, you have staff trainings, business associate agreements. Those tend to be the most foundational things that you need, okay? It's not that you need to have 100% of all of those things fully implemented before you can say that you're HIPAA compliant mm -hmm. or before you roll out your platform. You need to be able to show that in conjunction with each of those requirements, you have documented a clear good faith effort in implementing those, right? So let's say for risk analysis, you have to be able to show that you've actually done that risk analysis. Whether okay. or not all of the gaps were completely remediated, they might not be. It might, that might okay. take some time. You have to be able to show that you've implemented clear policies. Okay. Have all of those policies been fully operationalized? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, right? Uh, but you, at least you're showing that you're making that good faith effort and getting everything done, right? And year over year, that documentation just becomes clearer and clearer, right? Because as long as you're making those continuing efforts and continuing to document those things, uh, you get closer and closer to where you need to be. That's really what the government wants to see, right? It's a matter of being okay. able to have clearly documented good, mm -hmm. good faith mm -hmm. effort. So okay. Uh, okay. not necessarily, let's say, the minimum viable, but it is here is what the law requires, and here's what we've done so far to address these requirements in, in terms of documenting those efforts. Okay, okay. So it's like a quality control which you keep on, I'd say, improvising as you would keep building. You. Uh, oh yeah. You could. Yeah, you keep. You, 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 keep it's growing. a continuous process, right? To the government, this is not like a one and done type of a thing where you do this and then you're finished. It's a matter of. Uh, that's why that risk analysis has to be done annually, right? To the government, this is an ongoing process of continuing mm -hmm. a culture of compliance, mm -hmm. really, within your company. Right. Okay. And uh, let's say, again, um, um, another question that uh, was passed on to me by, by a healthcare entrepreneur is, uh, you know, while you want to safeguard the data, you also need to enable data visibility, especially uh, for health insurers and other third parties. So what is a HIPAA compliant manner to do so? Can you, can you say that and that last part one more time are you sure? what would be the yeah what would be the HIPAA compliant manner to do so because you also have to create the data visibility as well so let's mm -hmm. say you 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 need integration with insurance you need integration with uh, say a EMR or a EHR so what would be the right compliant manner to share data yeah. So what matters under HIPAA, HIPAA really doesn't have very hyper-specific technical security requirements. So you won't find that the regulation says, hey, you need this level of encryption implemented. You need this level of backup. You need this specific certification. There's nothing like that that's going to be in the reg. Okay. What the regulation states is that it's going to vary depending on your situation, right? Because what matters is that you be able to show that if you identified an area of risk, Mm -hmm. that you did what you could to address that area of risk, right? So mm -hmm. usually the simplest way is just to make sure that the data in the platform is encrypted, right? Mm -hmm. um, an even easier way to do that is to make sure that whoever you're using for hosting is mm -hmm. fully HIPAA compliant as well, that you have a business associate agreement, because then okay. as long as they're accessing it in that type of a secure environment, that's all that HIPAA is gonna really care about. Okay, so HIPAA is not very technically heavy uh, when mm -hmm. it comes to that sort of stuff. Okay, okay. So um, that means that your business uh, associate agreement is kind of that centerpiece uh, in integrations, for example. So, uh, what we would like to know more could be uh, like what are the steps of arranging the right 
BA? Like, so that, uh, like, what are the things that companies need to look into when they are having that uh, business associate agreement? And what are the things to make sure that uh, this BA is really compliant so that they don't end up having a BA, but still finding that, okay, they missed something. So are there any sure. steps or elaboration you could provide on that? Yeah, so the BAA is is really a standardized legal document, right? So you could even just go right to Health and Human Services and look at their BAA, right? Okay. And compare it to the BAA that, let's say, a vendor is asking you to sign. If you find significant discrepancies there, there might be an issue. Now, the majority of the big companies are going to be fine. Google, Microsoft, AWS, okay? But there are a handful of predatory vendors out there that would put stipulations in a business associate agreement that basically make you liable no matter what, okay? So okay. You, want to, you want to just keep an eye out for that. Uh, it's always good to review with legal counsel anytime you're signing that type of an agreement, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but the BAA is meant to be standard. Now, mm -hmm. there is an additional stipulation under the omnibus rule, which states that more than just signing a business associate agreement, you have to have assurances that the vendors that you're working with are compliant. This could be something as simple as doing a very basic vendor audit, right? So let's say you're working with a vendor, you send them a set of questions concerning their own privacy and security processes. It could be something like that. If it's a, a company like AWS, okay, mm -hmm. or Azure, you already know that they have security certifications in place, like SOC 1, SOC 2, um, some of the NIST standards that actually would supersede the requirements of the HIPAA security rule. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that those types of security certifications are in place, you can comfortably, you can feel comfortable that that type of a due diligence is not necessary. Um, but that's kind of what you want to be on the lookout for. So just potentially predatory vendors or business associate agreements. It's always good to consult legal counsel. And if it's a vendor that you're not sure, like let's say they don't have any advanced security certifications that would let you know that they are compliant already, always good to ask a series of questions regarding their own compliance program and their security, uh, their security standards that you can then have clearly documented as those assurances in that case. Are these questions easily available or these are questions that still require some expert to frame or something? Uh, so it depends. You could, you could very easily base the questions off of your own risk analysis. So let's say okay. you take some of those security questions from your own risk analysis and use that to build it out. Um, in, the, in the example like us, so uh, we, it's, it's not a bad idea to uh, again, either get legal counsel or consulting in the process of generating that that type of a questionnaire. We have one that's already pre-built that our clients use, uh, which could be sent out. So if you're able to find something like that, that could be a great idea. Okay, great. And I do have one last question from my end, and uh, then I'll also open uh, for others to ask. So one last question is that, um, you know, during this conversation, what I've understood is that eventually HIPAA is something not to be afraid about. These are eventually security safeguards, basically making sure that you are following the right practices to handle data and to make sure that, uh, you know, there's no data breach or data risk and so on. So uh, a question like uh, looking from, I'd say the other side of it is that how this, this all is different from your typical uh, security policy, which uh, could include, let's say, premise access restriction or data encryption. So these are things uh, like I think overall corporations or companies would all already have in place. So how, what is the special place of HIPAA in all of this? Really? Yeah, so let's say a very general security policy, right? Um, it'll more than likely get you close to where you need to be for HIPAA. The trouble mm -hmm. is that that documentation would not suffice in the event that there was some type of a HIPAA audit or a breach and you were being asked questions because the regulatory codes associated for HIPAA have to be built into those policies, right? Uh, because more than just a general security policy and procedure, the policies that you would need for HIPAA is what the law requires, okay? So it cites all of those regulatory codes 
And then it explains the corresponding procedure that you have to satisfy that aspect of the regulation. Okay. So, uh, and then of course there would be additional privacy requirements under HIPAA, things like the BIAs that you need, the specific HIPAA risk analysis. So uh, implementing a, a general security policy infrastructure, something like that could be a great place to begin on your way to becoming HIPAA compliant. Uh, but at, if you intend on doing it anyway, you might as well be just address HIPAA to begin with, because then you'll have everything that you need as the company is growing, okay. making it more scalable as you go. So we work with a lot of startups and for a startup, implementing a HIPAA compliance program can be really a piece of cake. Okay, it's not complicated when it all comes down to it, if you do this early, but let's say down the road, when you're a more well-established company and you have a lot of established processes, documentation can be a little bit more difficult because then we're circling back, trying to figure out what's there, what's not comparing, contrasting, swapping, replacing, right? Uh, and that is a little bit of a more involved process in a well-established company. So it's always best to do it early if you can. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Great. Thank you so much. This has been, again, <laughs> I mean, I'd say wonderful, but I mean really beyond that also. It's been really, really very good, Liam. So much good information. So awesome. I see a um, few questions already coming in. Uh, maybe I'll take them, start taking them one by one. So I see Michael has asked, if you are using AWS or the like, and they have a breach, what are your responsibilities, actions, or liabilities? Yeah, so this is exactly what the business associate agreement is for, right? So the business associate agreement, what it essentially says is, so let's say, Michael, um, your, your company, okay? Uh, in signing a business associate agreement, you're saying, I am responsible for my HIPAA compliance and any breaches that happen on my end. AWS is responsible for their HIPAA compliance and any issues that happen on their end, meaning it creates almost a firewall between you and any outside third parties, because as if AWS has a breach, you cannot be liable for something that happens as a result of that. If you have a breach, AWS can't be liable, right? So it benefits both parties in that regard and just make sure that each individual company is responsible for their own stuff, right? Your own compliance, your own breaches, you handle things independently. I uh, hope Michael this answers. Let me know if you'd like to speak, you can just raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, I'll take the next question. Alexandra has asked, uh, what is the best practice when reviewing vendors for compliance? So I think again, a lot of startups really have even software vendors, or like services vendors, and what could be the best practice when reviewing vendors for compliance? Yeah, so something like that, something like a, a, a due diligence questionnaire, which you could base off of your own uh, risk analysis is a great place to begin, just to make sure that they have the necessary measures in place uh, from a security or from a compliance perspective, right? Uh, but in general, the signing of the business associate agreement is always where you want to begin, okay? So irregardless, if you're working with a vendor, you want to make sure that you have the BAA in place because that's going to limit your liability uh, to begin with. Uh, that due diligence as an extra layer on top of that is just there so that if there's any type of an issue or discrepancy, you have clear documentation showing your good faith effort that you vetted that vendor to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? Uh, that due di diligence can be in the form of you just sending them that question, or it could be in the form of you checking to see if they have other types of existing security certifications, uh, which would supersede the requirements of HIPAA. So SOC 1, SOC 2, um, I think ISO 27001, uh, NIST 800, 171, all of those frameworks will more than satisfy the HIPAA security rule requirements. Now, that doesn't mean that that means that that company is compliant, but it means for the services that they are providing, they are satisfying the security rule. The other rules in this position would not be relevant for a vendor. Okay, uh, I think um, that answered for me, but again, Alexandra, if you need to, uh, uh, more information on this, please let me know. I'll open the mic for you. Um, in the meantime, Mazel has asked, would you not say that for all medical establishments, that is doctors, offices, hospitals, health insurance providers, properly observing data classification is must to ensure that HIPAA is observed? 
Yeah. So frankly, I, my, my own expertise from an, the IT side of things, so the IT security side of things, it's going to be a little bit more limited than my, uh, it, it's more, more general in nature than my more specific understanding as far as the uh, inner workings of compliance, let's say. Uh, so as far as observing data classification, I don't think that you could say that anything is a must when it comes to HIPAA because there are not gonna be any even specific encryption requirements under HIPAA, okay? What HIPAA says is that you have to protect the data. Encryption is often a best practice in the process of doing that, or the most efficient way of doing that. Now there's other technologies that have even been replacing things like encryption, like blockchain, right? Which is technically another form of encryption, but different from the what, what might be considered uh, the industry best practice, right? So data classification certainly would be highly advisable, should be done, right? Whether or not you could say that it is a must in order to ensure that HIPAA is observed, depends on the client's situation, depends on other things that they have implemented. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I, the regulation would not have a whole, whole lot more to say. It depends on the results of that organization's risk analysis and what they have implemented is my understanding of it. That's, uh, that sounds uh understandable uh okay and so i do not see any more questions but uh, um, people anyone if you have any question feel free to ask uh, raise your hand and in the meantime lem would you like to share more about compliance group what kind of work you guys do and uh, how um, you can help here anyone who is uh, looking to say get help on their HIPAA compliance to get overall uh, you know move forward in their journey of building a healthcare technology platform or a healthcare practice sure yeah so I, I did just share my, my screen again so that you could see my contact information if you'd like to reach out to me for more information but uh what we so the overall philosophy of what we do at compliancy group is we're kind of a hybrid model right so we're not a consulting service um we're not lawyer. We're not a. We're not like a legal group. Nothing like that. We are a software company ourselves. Okay, and what our software does is in that process, let's say, of conducting risk analysis, identifying gaps, implementing policies, staff trainings, BAAs. Our platform is designed to automate that process for a small to mid-sized company. So what we would do with you is we'd set you up with our software, uh, which actually allows you to conduct that risk analysis with us through a series of very simple yes no questionnaires we then automatically figure out where your gaps create tasks for you provide you with personalized and fully updated policies procedures any HIPAA forms trainings the BAAs all of that is then integrated into the platform and managed by us in the background so you have clear documentation around your compliance program that we could set up for you very quickly uh, along with our full verification. So once that process is completed and we have everything set up, BIAs tracked, policies implemented, staff trained, uh, we issue you our seal of compliance. That way, one of your clients could actually verify your compliance through us at any point in time. So if that seal is on your website, somebody could just click on it. They get routed to our verification page and can verify your compliance in real time whenever they want to. So uh, our service is not only designed to make it a little bit easier to get this all done, uh, it's hopefully will help you market your HIPAA compliance a little bit more effectively so that you could show it's been verified by a third party and we track everything to make sure it's maintained then year over year. So uh, we try to have to keep it a very, very simple approach, automate as much as possible just to make it easier for you to get this done. That's what we do. Okay, great. And um, if I may ask, you can choose to answer or not, but uh, how does the pricing works in terms of, is it like a SaaS per month payments or is it like one-time fees or like how are you yeah. structured? So it's a flat annual subscription. Most startup SaaS companies with us will have a subscription of about 2,500. So we do have specific startup pricing for software companies. It's around 2,500 annually, okay? Because again, all of these are annual requirements. So that's a, an annual subscription for us to assist in managing this every single year. If you are larger, if you're a larger company or out of that startup phase, it ranges. So there's a pretty broad range anywhere it could be. And if you're 
a mid, more mid-sized company for grand it could be a little bit higher than that depending on your situation but that's a general range and expectation of the pricing and it is always a flat annual subscription okay so our support and coaching to get you up to speed on compliance uh, we actually you have a dedicated rep on our end that works with you to get all of this done uh, the seal breach support if there ever is a breach even our audit response program it's all included uh, we've been doing this for 16 years we've got clients in 34 countries 50 states 400,000 users of the program we, we've never had a client fail an audit or be fined in the history of our company so you can rest assured we we support our clients well okay, that's awesome thank you lime i think uh, this has been very good very wonderful and really appreciate your time and you sharing your knowledge thank you so much